Okay, so we're going to sing Philippians 2, 5 to 11 here. Send more More Amen. All right. Let me be seated. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we're thankful for the incarnation of Christ, for his humbling himself in such an infinite way as to unite human nature with his divine person and suffer the death of the cross. Uh, we, are, we rejoice that he was exalted to the highest position as the God-man, and we look forward to his return and his, uh, the time when every knee shall bow. We voluntarily bow the knee to him now, and we ask that he would be glorified and honored in this Greek class, and that you'd strengthen the students here, those who can watch the video, to uh, learn the Word of God, that they might be able to know you in a greater way, know the blessed Christ who uh, suffered and died and rose and is exalted, and be able to more effectively proclaim him to the world. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to be looking at lesson number 13. It's right after lesson number 12, and it's before number 14. And it's in the first year Greek textbook, not the second year one. Not the Hebrew textbook, not the Trinitarianism textbook, but the Greek textbook. <laughs> Need to get more specific? Okay. The book is blue, hardcover, page 106. You got it now? Okay, all right. Okay, so we've got an exegetical insight here on dikaiosune, which means, what does dikaiosune mean? Um, righteousness. Righteousness, yeah, righteousness. So great word here uh, for righteousness. Uh, the exegetical insight is, is not bad. It, certainly righteousness is 
uh, an amazing thing. And it is right when he says that we cannot earn the righteousness of God, but it is uh, imputed to us by um, the Lord through repentant faith alone. So that particular quote at the end by Luther is great. Um, Luther, of course, unfortunately did believe in baptismal regeneration. Uh, he was able to fit that in with justification by faith alone by saying that when an infant is baptized or you know, sprinkled or immersed, he actually thought you should immerse the infants. When an infant was immersed, um, that the infant was given faith through the sacrament and was justified by faith alone apart from works, apart from baptism at the moment of the baptism. So that was how he put baptismal regeneration together with justification by faith alone. If you don't know that, it's going to be hard to talk to Lutherans because conservative Lutherans believe that today as well. Liberal Lutherans you know, couldn't care less what Luther said. But if you're talking to a conservative Lutheran, he probably believes that. So if you ask a conservative Lutheran, are you saved by baptism? No, no, no. Um, does baptism wash your sins away? No, it's the blood of Jesus, faith alone. You're like, wow, this guy must be saved. Uh, were you, when were you saved? Well, the moment, when, were you, were, when you were baptized as an infant, were you uh, born again at that moment? Yes, I was saved at the moment of my baptism uh, by faith alone uh, through the sacrament, the grace given through the sacrament. So you got to know that because it's, it's, it's more subtle than with Catholics. You know, Catholic, yep, this is baptism. <laughs> Lutherans are more subtle. So. And then, of course, he also held a consubstantiation that Jesus is in with and under the bread of the Lord's Supper, which actually undermines Christ's true humanity. They actually teach that um, Jesus' human, human nature became omnipresent at the time of the ascension. They do that so they can get his body in with and under the bread. Um, but that undermines his true humanity. A human nature that's omnipresent isn't truly human. <laughs> so his divine person is, is omnipresent, but his human nature isn't. So... Anyway, uh, but this particular quote by Luther is fantastic, and we're happy about that. And I would love to be wrong uh, in thinking that he believed a false gospel of baptism regeneration, and just maybe he was confused. I'd love to believe that. I have a hard time believe, defending it historically. But if I'm wrong, that would be fantastic. I'd be happy about that. So, all right, but the exegetical insight there, very good. Any comments, questions about that exegetical insight? Imputed righteousness? Do you know what the Catholic doctrine is of justification instead of imputed righteousness? What is the Catholic doctrine? For justification, the Bible and this exegetical insight teaches that we're declared righteous by the imputed righteousness of Christ, an extraneous righteousness, a righteousness external to us, reckoned to us judicially through repentant faith alone. What does the Catholic Church teach instead? A justification. Well, they do, yeah, they have seven sacraments. But what is their doctrine of justification? Purgatory. No, no. Justification is actually making you inwardly holy. Okay? So you're not justified solely by a righteousness external to you, but you're justified by the grace of God changing you on the inside and making you actually holy. And so you're justified based on your own righteousness, which you only have by grace, of course they would say. Um, if you actually read the specific statements of the Council of Trent on justification, they talk about it's all God's grace. They say stuff like that, okay? Um, but grace makes you inwardly righteous, and then you're declared righteous based on your righteousness, or even your righteousness plus imputed righteousness, but not only by imputed righteousness, but by imputed and imparted righteousness together is how you are made just. So you're not declared legally just based on an alien righteousness, a righteousness external to you, but you're made just by grace. And you are made just by God's grace through sanctification, but that's not how you're declared righteous. You're not justified based on that. So, it's good to know. Kind of like Seventh-day Adventists. Kind of like Seventh-day Adventists, though actually, they're actually, the Catholic doctrine of justification actually emphasizes the grace of God more than the Seventh-day Adventist one. The Seventh-day Adventist one says, in the last generation you have to stand before God without a mediator. I mean, a, a Catholic who knows, who believes in Trent, and I don't know if they believe in Trent anymore, <laughs> but if they believe in Trent, that would be horrible to stand before God without a meteor. I mean, you need Jesus. I mean, you need lots of meteors. You need Mary, too, right? You need Jesus. You need Mary. You need saints. If you're with no mediator, oh, no, what am I going to do? So, yeah. Chapter 13, the monstrative pronouns and adjectives. 
this and that. I can just see a picture like a, if I drew cartoons like a this or that, it looks like a monster. That would be demonstrative pronoun, this or that. Uh, so there's not much new in this chapter except for the vocative. We're going to see that the demonstrative pronouns function both as pronouns and adjectives. So they do both those things. The forms shouldn't be that bad. So not a whole lot to learn in this chapter. Uh, some review in here. Uh, the only thing new is, is that vocative case, fifth case. And the forms aren't that hard. They're quite close. The nominative vocative is not that big of a deal. So pretty short chapter, pretty straightforward. So let's talk about English demonstratives. So we have two, this and these. Or, uh, yeah, this and these is the one demonstrative, so this. And then we also have these, of course, as plural. And then that is the other demonstrative where the plural is those. So you have this, these, that, those. Okay? And this, these generally is the near demonstrative, referring to something in relative proximity. That and those would be the far demonstrative, something relatively far away. So if there was a, mon if there was a, a monstrous um, dragon, uh, it would be better to say, look at that dragon way over there than this dragon right here that's eating my leg. So the close demonstrative, this, these, far, further demonstrative, that, those. So, um, so near and far demonstrative. Now, the demonstratives in English are not inflected for case and gender. You say this in English, whether it's a subject, whether it's a direct object. You say these, whether it's men or women or whatever else. So in English, it's not inflected. But in Greek, there's different. It is inflected in Greek. So we've got the, this and these and that and those. Now, the demonstratives can function two different ways. They can function as pronouns, in which case they're standing on their own. So that is mine. Or they can function as adjectives. That book is mine. They're that modifying book. That car is mine. Or in a communist country, that house you own is mine. That um, if you're the government agent, that everything you have is mine, <laughs> right? So uh, that is mine, pronoun. That car is mine. That book is mine. That um, whatever is mine. That wallet is mine. If you're stealing something, that would be uh, the, the adjective. I told you about the guy who was getting robbed, and he said all he had was twenty dollars, right? Tell you. So the guy said, "Well, give me twenty dollars." He said, um, "Do you have change for a hundred? So anyway, so that was the guy getting robbed. So let's talk about Greek demonstratives now. OK, we have two of them. We have hutos. Yeah, quick, get away from these jokes. Get over to uh, get, get the demonstratives real quick. So uh, two Greek demonstratives, hutos and a kainos. Hutos is this or these. And we're like in 13.1 through 3 right now. So this, these, who toss, and then that, those is a kainos. Right? Two Greek demonstratives, who toss and a kainos. Now, the Greek demonstratives do have gender, unlike English demonstratives. That doesn't really affect our translation in English. We're still going to say this for the various forms of who toss and that for the various forms of kainos. That's how we're going to translate them. But It'll have, it can have exegetical significance. And we're going to call both hutos and ekenos Greek demonstratives rather than calling one identical form a demonstrative pronoun and the other identical form a demonstrative adjective because they function both as pronouns and adjectives. You could call it when it's acting as a pronoun a demonstrative pronoun and when it's functioning as an adjective a demonstrative adjective. But we're just going to call them demonstratives. Save some, some lalia. <laughs> Yeah, the bird. Yeah, the bird banged into the window. Bird wants to learn Greek too. So yeah, yeah. See, the birds are banging on the windows trying to get in to learn Greek. Yeah, yeah. There. We <laughs> this bird, that bird, banging on the window. This bird is in the room walking around. Okay, hutos, a kainos. Let's talk, take a look then at these Greek demonstratives. Pretty straightforward. The first one has a few oddities but pretty straightforward. So here we have the forms of hutos in the singular. 
And of course, we always memorize the nominatives, and then we memorize the stem for words like this. So the nominatives are hutas, haute, tuta, and the stem is toot. So toot without the u at the end, like in the genitive singular. And the yellow ones are the ones that are kind of strange. So when you memorize the nominatives, you've pretty much got it, all the stuff that's weird. And then after that, it's quite regular. So this is 13.4. And oftentimes, as in other words, the nominative has most of the weirdness, which of course is why we always, like with nouns, memorize the genitive too, because the nominative does weird things. So once we get past that nominative, it's a regular 2-1-2 adjective. So second declension, first declension, second declension for the masculine, feminine, neuter. Now in that nominative, what's happened is the initial tau has been replaced by a rough breath mark. So you can see like instead of two toss, you have who toss. Instead of tau te, you have how te. So that happened. And that's why we have hutas and haute instead of something with a tau. Basically, that's it. Now, remember, we learned a word in the last chapter, a pretty important word, that looks a lot like this word. Can you remember what it was? It's something like if you dropped something on your toes, you'd say, ow, toss. Yeah. We learned autos, okay? Now, autos is always alpha, upsilon, smooth breath mark, okay? And that, we said that would help us learn, distinguish that from a different word, and this is the word that we're distinguishing it from. So autos is always alpha, upsilon, smooth breath mark. This is always with a rough breath mark here, okay? So, Hutas always either either has a rough breath mark or a tau. So autos is always alpha upsilon smooth breath mark. Hutas is either a rough breath mark or a tau. And that's how you can remember which is which. Hutas versus autos. Except for those initial nominative forms here, hutas, I just said autos. Hutas is very straightforward. Just a 2 1 2 adjective, except for one thing. Uh, take a look at that vowel after the initial tau in the genitives. You have tu ta and you have tau taste. So in the masculine and neuter, it's an omicron in all the forms after the tau. In the feminine, it's an alpha after all the forms with the tau. So it's not an alpha male, it's an alpha female here. Maybe it's feminist, I don't know. But why, uh, now that doesn't change the parsing. All the stuff at the end the, the parsing is, is the same for the forms. It's a 2 1 2, it's just that Omicron or al Alpha at the front. So, why is it Omicron or Alpha? This is the rule. I don't have a slide for the rule, but this is the rule. If the final stem vowel is an O class vowel, Omicron or Omega, then the first vowel goes to Omicron. But if the final stem vowel is an Alpha or an Eta, and the first stem vowel is an alpha. So the final vowel and the first one match each other. That's why in the tuta, the genitive singular, we have omicron, omicron, and these match each other too. Alpha and eta are the same, considered in the same class. So I guess the hutas is just a very agreeable word. So the last one and the first one here will agree in their class. So I'll say the rule one more time. If the final stem vowel is an O class vowel, Omicron or Omega, Omega, Omicron, then the first vowel goes to Omicron. If the final stem vowel is Alpha or Eta, like in the feminine, then the first stem vowel is Alpha. So that's the rule. Basically what that comes out to be is the masculines and neuters all have the Omicron, and then the, um, the um, you know, in the singulars you have this Alpha and Eta for the feminines though in two-tone it changes over because of that final omega. So that's the rule. The final and first one agree. And so that's hutas haute tuta. From the stem toot, it's perfectly regular in the singular except for those nominatives and we have that rule. So let's say them all together. 
hūtās haute tūtā, tūtū tautēs tūtū, tūtō taute tūtō, tūtān tautēn tūtā. And you can learn them across. Let's say it one more time. Hūtās haute tūtā, tūtū tautēs tūtū, tūtō taute tūtō, tūtān tautēn tūtā. All right, let's go to the plurals. The plurals, it's like the singular in the nominative masculine and feminine plural. The initial tau is replaced by a rough breath mark. So you have hūtoi and haute, a rough breath mark instead of the tau. Other than that, it's perfectly regular. Now, in the feminines, notice it's hautai, two-tone, tautai, tautas. Why does the genitive plural have an omicron for the feminine? Uh, in the two, why is it two-tone and not tautone for the feminine singular? Good, because the final vowel is omega because of that rule. So the only time in the feminine we don't have an alpha at the front is that genitive plural. Then it's two-tone all the way across. Every other one, you've got your alpha at the end or eta at the end, and so you have an alpha at the front. Okay, let's say the plurals. Hūtoi, hautai, tauta, two-tone, 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 tūtois, tautais, tūtois, tūtus, tautas, tauta. All right, very good. So those are the forms of hūtas, really not that bad. Uh, any questions on that? Okay, let's go to Akanos, 13.5. So Akanos is also perfectly regular. It's a 2 and 2 adjective. It follows a sub-pattern in the neuter that does not have a case ending in both the nominative and accusative singular. So it's a kana versus something with an ending. Uh, in other words, there's no new at the end. But uh, you may be used to that by now. And so the singular is perfectly regular. So let's go ahead and say the forms of Akanos. Ekanos, ekane, ekana, ekanu, ekanes, ekanu, ekano, ekane, ekano, ekanon, ekanain, ekana. All right, and let's look at the plurals. The plurals are perfectly regular, so that's good. Um, just regular, so no problem. Let's go say them though. Ekanoi, ekanai, ekana. A canone, a canone, a canone, a canois, a canice, a canois, a canus, a canos, a cana. So no trouble in the plural. Those are the forms, or should I say these are the forms? These are the yeah, it's called cool. these. These are the forms of hutas and canos. So I don't think you'll have too much trouble with those. It's not too bad. All right, let's talk about translating demonstratives, 13.7. We're going to break down our uses into whether they are functioning as pronouns or whether they're functioning as adjectives. If a demonstrative is functioning as a pronoun, how will you know that? Well, it's pretty easy. The hutos or kanos will be standing on its own with nothing to modify. So it'll be independent, standing on its own, and that's the clue that it's functioning as a pronoun, not modifying anything. In terms of the form of the pronoun and how you translate it, that's also pretty much common sense at this point. If it's functioning as a subject, what case is it going to be in? Uh, no. Nominative, yeah, nominative. If it's functioning as a direct object, what case will it be in? No, no. Direct object, not indirect object, indirect object would be dative. Yeah, accusative, be accusative. So basically, whatever it's functioning as, it'll be in that case. Okay, so that's pretty easy. So a case is determined by function, which is just like all other pronouns. And gender and number will be determined by what word for a pronoun? This is a pronoun. What determines the gender and number of a pronoun? Word that starts with an A. Article. No. no. Article is your friend, though. It's not your uncle. The antecedent. 
The antecedent determines it, right? So the, the, word it's modif the word it's referring back to, the antecedent determines the, the gender or number. So if Hutas is referring to a lady, that one lady, it's going to be nominative, or it's going to be feminine singular. And whatever it's doing in the sentence will determine the case. If it's referring to a group of um, men, then it will be masculine plural, something like that. So no surprises here. Okay? Uh, the only, uh, so case determined by function, gender, number by antecedent, that's fine. The only oddity is you will sometimes come across a hutos or a kanos, and you'll translate it as this or as that, but it won't quite make sense. So with demonstrative, sometimes you do need to add an extra word, this man, this one, that woman, depending upon you know, what, what it is. Okay? So common sense will make it clear whether or not to make that extra word masculine or feminine or neuter or singular or plural. So let's say you come across a nominative masculine singular form of hutas by itself. You could translate it as this or as this man or if it's being used generically this one, something like that. If you came across a cani, the nominative plural feminine, you would translate it as those or if the context required it as those women, okay, something like that. And the added man or woman or one is, as it were, a KJV italicized word, okay? And so maybe you can't really write in italics if you're writing, I mean, you can do it if you're typing your homework, but not otherwise, but you could put it in brackets. So I'll just give you a few examples here. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. You, it, it, you put them in cursive versus print and cursive. That'll work. Print and cursive will work. Or you put them in brackets. But just as an example here, here are the scribes were saying within themselves about Christ. Christ said he'd just forgiven somebody's sins. And, of course, sins are committed against. Why was it blasphemy for Christ to say that your sins are forgiven you if he was not the God-man? Why would that be blasphemous? Yeah, only God can forgive sins. So unless Jesus is God, he can't forgive sins because sins are committed against God. Like if you, if Heoth sinned against Timotheos, um, I couldn't forgive that sin. Timotheos would have to forgive Heoth, and of course God would have to forgive the sin. Okay? But uh, since all sins are against God, God can forgive sins against himself. And so when he was saying he could forgive sins, that was blasphemy if he's not God. So anyway, you can see here in the Greek, when they were saying this man blasphemeth, it was just hutos blasphemé. Blasphemé is blasphemeth. Hutos is this, but you have to supply this man. It's, it's nominative singular. And you can see the contempt. This blasphemeth is what they're saying, right? This man blasphemeth is what they're saying within themselves. So you can see this is an example where you need to supply the word man to that nominative singular word this. Hutos blasphemé. All right? Note here, by the way, as well, just like generally with the King James italics, there's no express word for the italicized word. There's no word anthropos there. But is the word man here implied by the Greek? Is, is there support in Greek for man, or is it, would it be better just to take that word man out and just say this blasphemeth? It's implied. It's implied. Yeah, it's implied because it's mass singular. You couldn't just say that. You couldn't just supply woman instead or frog, right? It, 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 you have to have man. So generally with King James italics, it's not just they're just putting words in because it just feel like it. It's something that's not stated explicitly, but it is implied in the underlying language. So italicized words are a definite great thing in the King James, which unfortunately is lost in modern versions. And the presence fits with verbal plenary inspiration. Uh, if you're speaking to a new Christian, though, you want to make sure he knows why the word's italics, because people think italics you know emphasis, right? You want to make sure people know that, why they're actually italicized. So anyway, uh, to sum up with, with hutos or kanos, sometimes uh, sanctified common sense in the translation if you need to supply a word with a demonstrative. So hutos, this man, if necessary, or this, these women, or whatever. But skipping ahead just for a second, 13.9, the other kind of odd thing that happens when the demonstrative is functioning as a pronoun is relates to the fact that language changes over time, which is true. We don't still speak Middle English like Chaucer did. In Biblical or Koine Greek, 
the demonstratives were weakening in force in comparison to the significance they had in classical Greek. So in classical Greek, it was a stronger this, while in Koine, it had softened somewhat, okay, not quite as strong. And so that's, that means that sometimes the context will support the translation of the demonstrative pronoun as if it was a personal pronoun. So in other words, instead of as the demonstrative this or that, you could translate as the personal pronoun he. Sometimes it doesn't have a strong this or that, it's just he. I'll give you some examples. Here are a few examples in the authorized version. So here in Matthew 13, 22, he also that received seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. So he that heareth the word is hutos uh, estin haton logon akuon. So here the King James translates hutos as he. And likewise in 13, 23, he that heareth the word hutos estin haton logon akuon. So sometimes there, that does take place, and he talks about that in 13.9. And so that is actually legitimate. It's not just some kind of dynamic equivalence thing where, where Mount says you can translate it as he. This is actually true that hutos and akainos can get weakened a bit in koine in comparison to classical Greek. So just let context be your guide with that. Uh, generally this or these or, or that, but certain situations it can be weak into a he. Okay, so that's pretty much how, what happens when they function as pronouns. Questions on how they function as pronouns? Is there any determiner on when it would be translated as he outside of just? It would just be, yeah, it, there's nothing syntactically that would tell you this versus he. It would just be kind of context. Is it, is it, more an emphatic this, or is it just kind of a, doesn't really have this sense to it. Yeah, just be, it's just gonna be context. So no, nothing in the, nothing syntactical. Nothing like, no specific marker that tells you. That's a good question. Any other questions? This question was good. That question, um, okay. So that's how they function as demonstratives, or uh, that's how the demonstratives function as pronouns. Now, what if they function as adjectives? Well, then they are pretty much like other adjectives. If hutos or kainos is modifying any other word, it will pick up that word's gender and number. The only oddity here, and this is one we've seen before with both autos, when it's used as an intensive, and with pos, all, all we were saying is give pos a chance, is, and so we've seen it with that toss and with pos, so it won't be too bad, is demonstratives when they're functioning as adjectives will be in the predicate position, not in the attributive position. Attributive position. So they won't be articular, they'll be anarthrous, they'll be predicate position, not attributive position. So most adjectives, the vast majority, attributive position. But who toss, autos, and pos, and a canos, are predicate position even when they're functioning as adjectives. So in the sentence here, hutos ha anthropos, you can see there's no article on hutos, it's in the predicate position. Hi anthropoi akenoi, again, no article on akenoi, predicate position. Quick review here, the attributive predicate position. So first attributive was article adjective noun, ha agathos anthropos, the good man. Second attributive, article noun, article adjective, Ha anthropos ha agathos, which is again the good man. Uh, third attributive, anthropos ha agathos, again the good man. Predicate first, predicate position, agathos ha anthropos, the man is good. Second predicate, ha anthropos ha agathos, the man is good. And there's no third predicate. And so notice here the key distinguishing feature is whether or not the adjective has an um, yeah, the article, whether there's an article with the adjective or not. So in uh, hutos ha anthropos and hoi anthropoi kenoi, hutos and kenoi do not have the article, they're predicate position, uh, but you translate that as this man or those men. Okay? Pretty much common sense when you have demonstratives functioning as adjectives. Comments, questions about that? This chart is worth memorizing. Okay. 
Um, th the professor in BBG in 13.8 and 10 tells you how to say to one person that the Lord Jesus loves him and how to say to a group that the Lord Jesus loves them. He does use them instead of him as the gen uh, generic singular pronoun because you have to be all feminist and all that. So tell someone that Jesus loves them, he says, instead tell someone that Jesus loves him. Uh, oh well. But he says if you speak, speak to one person, you would say, Ha Jesus se agapa. Jesus loves thee. How do you tell a group of people that Jesus loves them? Ha Jesus humas agapa. He says, now go find someone, introduce yourself, and tell him that Jesus loves him. So, hello, my name is Blah. What is your name? Uh, and he says, them, instead of the one person, him. My name is blank. You, Jesus loves you. Him. Yes, Jesus loves me. You, goodbye. He, he goodbye. So, why don't you do that? So, who wants to be... Well, we'll both do. So, uh, why don't you... Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? And then uh, do what this says here. Anamoy. 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 Hey, Aston. I had to look back. Hi, Oh, wait, wait. We forgot the what is your name. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Anamoy. Anima. Anima. Aston. No, to Anima. Uh, Sue Esten, what is the name of, of you? Uh, Sue and oh, now he has to reply. Okay, so my name is. <laughs> there we go, there we go. Okay, yeah, so he talks about that. Hello, my name is on page 68, if you need to go back there. Just ta Anamamoy Esten. Dawid, and then Tisoy Anima Estin. What is thy name? So that's 68. If you need to rush back there. So okay. So that. Oh, so now you can keep going. Um, ha Yesu. Jesus. Jesus. Um, se Amen. And then yes, Jesus loves me. What's yes? Hey, nai Jesus me agapa. Okay, all right. And then you can say, what's, what's the next thing he has us say here? No, not Alf Vieter say. No, 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 no. Goodbye is Erosa. Erosa. All right. Okay, now you get to switch. All right. Do it the other way. Um, he just did it. I know. Kyra, moi anam, moi no anam moi tamata as estin, tisoi anam estin. Anam moi hea estin. It's a great thing to tell people. Me agapa. All right, not too bad. Since we're there. Uh, this actually, I didn't write this, but the Mounts actually wrote this. is kind of neat. We're going to sing. This is just, just, just so we get. This is, this is a pr great, great place. We're going to sing. We're going to sing Jesus loves me in Greek, because that's just pretty neat. So, you want to? We have it here. Jesus loves me, but Bill Mounts. Ha Jesus me agapa, hati grafe keruse, because the scripture preaches it. Says so. Paidia esenauto, children are to him. As the new si dunatai, they are weak, but he is strong. Nai Jesus agapa, yes Jesus loves. Nai Jesus agapa, yes Jesus loves. Nai Jesus agapa, 
Hey, grafe keruse. The scripture proclaims it. Okay. Let's stand up too. Ha Jesus me agapa ha di grafe keruse pi dia esen auto asthenusi dunatai. Na Jesus agapa, na Jesus agapa, na Jesus agapa, he grafe keruse. Amen. That's a great little song there. Okay, we're ready to move on to the vocative. <clears throat> so if you get discouraged learning Greek, remember, na Hiesus uh, Agapon. All right. Let's talk about the vocative here. 13.10. So, we generally view Greek as having four cases, and you can call the vocative a fifth case, but it's so much like the nominative that it's disputable whether it really is its own case or not. All right. And so the vocative is defined as the case of direct address. Got that? Okay, good. Uh, in other words, you're speaking directly to another person, or maybe you're speaking to a thing if you are having a bad day. No. You know, well, people speak to their computers. Hurry up, right? So uh, you could speak to a thing. That would be vocative. Um, Jonathan Edwards had a great resolution. If you've ever read the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards, they're really good. One of his resolutions was never to get frustrated with any inanimate object. That's a good, good resolution. So, um, <laughs> he didn't have a smartphone. <laughs> yeah. What? How could he survive? No smartphone, LOL. Okay, so. Um, Anyway, we generally view Greek as having four cases. Vocative is, could be considered a fifth case, but it's so much like the nominative, it's disputable whether it really is its own case. And there also are a lot fewer. There are vocatives. There's plenty of vocatives, but there are a lot fewer in comparison to the nominatives, the genitives, the datives, and accusatives. So you're speaking directly to somebody in the vocative. And the words used to address that other person will be in the vocative case. So if you were to address me, Didaskalos Ross, that would be vocative case. Uh, I said it in Greek, so I'm, yeah. Um, vocative is the case of direct address. Um, actually, so then it'd be didaskale, didaskale, Ross. And a word is put in the vocative when you're directly addressing another. So here are some examples. Matthew 7, 22, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Kuria, kuria, that's vocative, all right? There's an example of the vocative case. Oh, there are 607 vocatives in the New Testament. So that's a lot, but it's not like thousands and thousands for the other words, other cases. The most common words in the vocative are kuria, 121 times, adelphoi, 106 times, pater, 29 times, or pater with a eta, six times you have pateres. You have andres, 32 times, men, and didaskal, a teacher or master, 31 times. So those are the most common words in the vocative. So here on uh, Judgment Day here, Matthew 7, those unconverted persons professing Christ will say, Kuria, Kuria, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Cast of devils, done many wonderful works, he says. I knew you, but you lost your salvation. Oh, no, I mean, he says, I never knew you. Uh, so he says they were never saved. Um, by the way, I just pointed out, when he said they were doing many wonderful works in this text, um, it's... You can see here it's dunai, dunames, polos, many, uh, many, dunime, many works, many mighty acts of power. It's actually talking about these people were saying they're doing miracles. Polos, dunames, is not specifically saying they were trusting in their works to be saved. It's actually saying they're doing many miracles in his name. Now, of course, work salvation does condemn many people to hell, but this verse isn't, in this verse, they're not saying, haven't, have we done, haven't we done lots of good works to be saved? They're saying, we've prophesied in the name, we've cast out devils, we've done many miracles in your name. And he says, I never knew you, depart from me. So just, just, it's not really the best verse to use to say work salvation is wrong. Work salvation is wrong, it's condemned by 
vast numbers of verses. But this one's talking about miracles. They were saying they were doing main, main miracles. What is it? Yeah, it does condemn the end times charismatic movement. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. It's a pretty uh, sobering warning. Sobering warning. These people are obviously sincere. They're shocked that he says, I never knew them. You know, all, with charismatics also saying you can lose salvation, it actually undermines the possibility. They don't take, at, I mean, they, they can take, they can, they're not going to deny that somebody can profess to be saved and not really be born again. But it kind of undermines that because all the people who apostatize, they can say, oh, they were genuinely saved, they just lost it. And you often, that tends to downgrade what scripture teaches about how you can profess Christ and have a lot of things without being genuinely converted. So, anyway, uh, so example evocative, Lord, Lord, Korea, Korea. And in terms of form, in the plural, all vocatives have the same form as the nominative. So, in Acts 22.1, when Paul says, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you, Andres, Adolfoi, Kai, Patres, Andres, Adolfoi, and Patres are vocative. He's speaking directly to them. But the forms of the words are identical to the nominative. So here, the form doesn't tell you whether it's nominative or vocative. The context shows you it's a direct address, vocative. Because in the plural, Nominative and vocative have exactly the same form. Uh, and then we have, now, in the singular, if the vocative is first declension, it's also identical to the nominative. So again, nothing new to learn there. So in, in Luke 12, 19, and I'll say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Kai ero te psukemu, psuke, ekes paula agatha. So psuke, soul, is first declension, you know, it's fe that feminine. And the form is identical. So that could, looks to just like a nominative. It's evocative because he's directly speaking to his soul. But the form is identical. So all no, evocative plurals are the same as nominatives. First declension, vocative and nominative singulars, exen, have the same form. Um, so um, if it's a second declension singular, there is a case setting for the vomitive. And that's epsilon. So if you're exhorting a fellow preacher, okay, but thou, O man of God, sude o anthrope tu theu. So instead of anthropos, you have anthrope. So you have that epsilon there, and that is the ending for the vocative. So, O man of God, O anthrope tu theu. Flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So second declension singular does have a distinct vocative form. Epsilon is your ending. And so that would identify, identifies it. Now what if you were addressing a plurality of men of God? How would you, what would the vocative be for a plurality of men of God? What would you say? Anthropoi tutheu because there's no distinct form in the plural for the vocative. So it would just be anthropoitutheu is how you would address a bunch of men of God, but one singular man of God would be anthropetutheu, man of God, all right? Now, if it's the third declension in the singular for the most, so first declension, singular, no ending. Second declension, singular, epsilon. Third declension, singular, vocative, Mostly it's just the stem of the word, but sometimes the vowel changes a bit. So sometimes there's, there's oblot. Oblot, of course, is that term. The vowels change in length, omicron and omega, switching to each other, um, stuff like that. So um, there can be oblot, but generally it's the bare stem. So in the model prayer, we have, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. Father is, of course, we're directly addressing God the Father. And there it's pater hemon, ha en tois anthropois. So the lexical form is pater with an eta, pater patros ha. Here we have an epsilon, pater, but it's still not too hard to recognize. All right, so there the vocative is pater, directly addressing the father. 
So in general, vocatives are very simple, mainly because identifying them is easy, both because of context. I mean, you can just see if somebody's speaking directly to somebody else. And because the forms are really nothing new to learn here, or very little new to learn, just an epsilon and second declension singulars, and a bare stem for the third declension. Um, and then first declension is same as nominatives. Plurals are all the same as the nominative. Once in a while, you may end up translating vocative plurals as nominatives because you don't realize what's going on. So you want to watch out for that. But generally, context makes it pretty easy. Any questions on vocatives? No. All right. So here, once in our chart, direct address, curia, plural is like the nominative, andres, singular. First declension is just like the nominative, like psuche. Second declension, you take an epsilon. Third declension, just this bare stem, sometimes with oblot, and the context makes it easy. OK, let's talk about odds and ends. A few odds and ends. 13.11. First one is the degree of an adjective. Adjectives have, what, three degrees, which is not bad, considering that you have about 98.6 degrees. So three degrees is not bad. Uh, the first degree is called the positive degree. We have the positive, the comparative, and the superlative. The positive is just the normal use of the adjective, fast. You're going fast. Okay? The second degree is the comparative, where you're comparing two different things, faster. So he, I was going fast, he was going faster. And so he won, he went, won the ski, going down the ski, ski trail, he beat me to the bottom. And the third degree is a superlative. This is where you're comparing three or more things. So fastest, OK? So fast, faster, fastest, positive, comparative, and superlative. Now, we have those three degrees of adjectives in Greek as well. Positive, comparative, and superlative adjectives uh, and forms. Now, a further thing to keep in mind, in Koine Greek, the superlative is dropping out of use. So it still is there but it's dropping out. And so because of this, you can run across a form that technically is comparative, but it's comparative used as a superlative. So you might have a comparative form, made zone, greater, um, and megastos, it would be the, so you might, might have a comparative form, but it really means superlative, greatest, when it's just the form greater, all right? And so sometimes that can lead to some interesting exegetical decisions. Uh, you have to decide if comparative is being used as a superlative or if a comparative is simply being used in its ordinary comparative use. All right. So in any case, there are three forms. There's positive, comparative, and superlative. And sometimes the comparative can be used for the superlative. That's 13.11. Questions about that? No, it's just going to be context, nothing yet. Syntactically, he's going to tell you. One of the reasons Koine Greek gets, like, we, with this thing too, and then the, this, these getting watered down a little bit in Koine versus um, uh, classical Greek, is of course Koine is a Weltsprache, it's a world language. And so when you have Greek being spoken by all these people, that it's kind of their second language. Oftentimes, if you learn language as a second language, some of the subtleties and nuances, maybe some people are slower to pick those up. Right? They, it, so things tend to get more basic when it's your second, something is your second language versus when it's what you've spoken your whole life. So classical Greek, you know, the Greeks were there. They hadn't taken over the world yet. Koine Greek, they're taking over the world. Greek is being spoken by everybody. That also speaks these other languages, and they also learn Greek later. And so some of the subtleties kind of go away, and it's a little more simple in Koine. So um, degree of adjective, fast, faster, fastest. Comparative, sometimes used for superlative. Second odd and end is, is something we call crosses. Uh, crosses isn't when um, you see you're taking a test and you realize you don't know the answers. Uh, that could be a crisis, but a crosses is different. So a crosses is where you put two words together. Now, if you put two cars together, one of them is yours, and they're going fast, that could be a crisis. But this is crosses. 
So they retain the same meaning, but they're pushed together into one form. Right? Now, you can't just push any two words together into one form, only certain words. In fact, there are very few words you can do. BBG lists all of them on page 342, and I think we're going we're to talk about what they are a little bit later. Uh, there are not very many of them, but in this chapter, the crossus that you're going to see is cago. Cago is a combination of chi and ego. It's just and and I put together cago instead of chi ego. Cago. And it just means and I. So often t with the examples of crosses that we're going to see are sometimes some of these very common words like that. And is very common. I is very common. So instead of people saying chi ago, they just said cago. And there we go. So that's what crosses is. Putting two words together. Smushing them together, same meaning, just stuffed together. If you have trouble with crosses, you may want to make a separate vocabulary card when it takes place. If you recognize it without too much trouble, you may be able to just recognize it when you come across it. Last odd and end, this is 13.13. .13. Um, is the word palus, which means much or many. So we have the forms up here in the singular. It's kind of a cross between a second and a third declension word. And you'll memorize, of course, the nominatives, palus, pale, palu. And now, if you look at this, if you just look at this, palus, pale, palu, palu, pale, palu, etc., some of them. You say, wow, this is, the endings look strange. There's an oop. I mean, what are these endings in the nominative? Sometimes you have a double lambda. Sometimes you have a single lambda. This is a weird word. This is really hard. This is a crisis. A crisis? No, a crisis. But there is a pattern here, and it's one we've seen several times now. Just remember the nominatives are the most unusual. You're going to memorize the nominatives. Uh, and then... Paulus is, once you get outside the nominative, it's actually very regular. It's not bad at all. Just the nominatives are unusual, and you're going to memorize the nominatives anyway. So uh, you memorize the nominatives, and the stem is Paul with two lambdas. All right? So you, once you memorize the nominatives, and then the stem has the two lambdas, everything else is really, really not bad. Um, the accusative singular, masculine, has a new on it, which it's kind of pulling its ending over from the third declension. But other than that, the word is, is regular. It's not bad. Okay. Of course, the, in the neuter, the um, nominative and accusative are the same. So you have that single lambda down there. But other than that, the double lambda Paul, the nominatives are weird. But after that, you're not bad. So let's say the, say the singulars here. Paulus, Paulé, Paulu. Paulu, Paulais, Paulu, Paulo, Paulé, Paulo, Pauloon, Pauline, Paulu. Move over to the plurals, and the plurals are perfectly regular. Pauloi, Paulai, Paula, Paulon, 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 Paulois, Paulais, Paulois, Paulus, Paulas, Paula. So you didn't know, Paulone is a Greek word. It's not just an English word for stuff that comes from flowers. It's a Greek word as well. All right. So that's uh, Paulus. So just memorize the nominatives. Remember the stem is Paul. And then you've pretty much, with two lambdas, and it's not bad. So that's the last odd and end. Much many. Questions about that? It's not that odd, but it is an end. OK. Uh, summary of the chapter. What have we learned? We have learned the demonstratives. The demonstrative this, these, hutos, and the demonstrative that, those, akanos. Furthermore, we've learned that the demonstratives can function as pronouns, in which case their case is determined by function, and their gender and number by antecedent. We've seen that demonstratives, when they're functioning as pronouns, sometimes are weakened to the personal pronoun, he or they, something like that, instead of the actual demonstrative this, these, that, those. We also saw that demonstratives can function as adjectives. In that case, they're very regular. The only unusual thing about the demonstrative functioning as an adjective is that it occurs in the predicate position instead of the attributive position. 
We also saw the final case in Greek, the vocative, very much like the nominative. In fact, in the plural, it was completely like the nominative. Outside of the plural and first declension singular, where again, it's just like the nominative, there's only two forms to know. Second declension singular uses epsilon as the ending, curia. And the third declension singular uses the bare stem, sometimes with change in the final vowel, sometimes with oblat, so pater. That's it. Then in terms of odds and ends, we saw the degrees of adjectives. There are the positive, the comparative, and the superlative forms. And we saw the superlative is dropping out of use, so we can sometimes have the comparative form used with the superlative meaning. We also looked at crosses, which is taking two words and cramming them together. So kago means and I. And we looked at the paradigm for paulus, pale, palu, and saw that as long as you memorize the lexical form in all genders and the stem, the word is absolutely regular. So that's the end of chapter 13. Not too bad of a chapter. And we only have one more chapter, which we're going to look at here, chapter 14, in the entire noun system. After chapter 14, you will know the entire Greek noun system. That is pretty good. And we will be done with the noun system. You will know everything you need to know for first year Greek about Greek nouns. And so that's going to be great. And then we're going to get to get into verbs, Lord willing. And the exercises do get even more exciting than they are now when you get to do verbs. So almost one, only one more announce. Good job, almost done. Let's look at the vocabulary. So this one, if you're married, you can use this one all the time. Uh, I'll say it, uh, and then we'll say it together. Gune, gunaikos, hey, woman, wife. Gune, gunaikos, hey, woman, wife. So how do you say my wife? Heath. Mu, wife of me, right? Or hey gune mu, the wife of me. Okay, my wife. Hey gune mu. Yeah. See, now that's a useful Greek word. You can use that one all the time. Use it around the house. Okay. So gune is declined like sarx. Sarx is on page 348. And he says, notice he says there's N3B1. Um, N3B1 is sarx. Might as well. Just go over there real quick, can't hurt. So they go to page 348 of Mounts. Let's say the forms of Sarx real quick. All right. So here we have Sarx. Say it together. Sarx, Sarkos, Sarki, Sarka, Sarx, Sarkes, Sarcone, Sarxi, Sarkos. Okay? So gune is just like that. So gune, gunaikos, gunaiki, gunaika, etc. Now the, the ik is lost in the nominative singular because it's actually good. Having a wife is not icky. Okay? Maybe you think that when you're a little kid, but having a wife is great. So it's not icky. So it loses the ik. All right? And so uh, you can see from the fact that that uh, yoda kappa in the nominative is dropped. Why, just another illustration of why you need to actually learn not just the nominative, but the genitive too. If you thought gune, you're trying to put all the endings on gune, you're going to get totally messed up. Because you have the gunaikos, gunaiki, it has that uh, yoda kappa. So of, of course, you memorize the genitive as well as the nominative and the article. So gune, gunaikos, hey. Uh, okay, next word here. Dekaiasune, dekaiasunes, hey, righteousness. Dekaiasune, dekaiasunes, hey, righteousness. Dodeca, 12. Dodeca, 12. A dodecagon is a plane with 12 sides of 12 angles. When I was a kid, I made a rhombi isododecahedron, which is this big shape. It's actually still hanging in my mom's garage. It's a big, like, shit. It has a lot of, I don't even remember how many, like, sides it has, but it has a lot. It was a rhombi isododecahedron. But dodeca is 12. Heau tu, heau teis, heau tu, himself, herself, itself, plural, themselves. Heau tu, heau teis, heau tu, himself, herself, itself, plural, themselves. Now, note on the, this is the reflexive pronoun, himself, herself, itself. And the lexical form is genitive singular, because it's, it's, since it's reflexive, it just does that. 
um, of me, of him. And the word is pars like autos, like he tells you there. And it can be translated as first or second person. So you can use how to for myself, ourselves, or thyself or yourself, as well as its predominant usage is the third person reflexive pronoun, himself, herself, itself, themselves. So the large majority of the time, how to, how taste, how to, will be himself or herself or itself or themselves. But on occasion, it can also be myself or ourselves, first person, or thyself or yourselves, um, second person. So that is worth keeping in mind if the sentence calls for that. So how taste. How to, how taste, how to. Ekanos, ekane, ekanon. Singular, that man, woman, thing. Plural, those men, women, things. Ekanos, ekane, ekana. That man, woman, or thing. Those men, woman, or things. A, or than. A, or than. And he says there, do not confuse this with the article hey, which always has a rough breath mark. So hey, the article has the rough breath mark. A has a smooth breath mark. And you don't want to confuse them. I mean, you don't want to see the word or and think it's an article, right? So don't confuse them. A is or or than. Hey is that feminine singular article. A, A, cago and I or but I. Cago. And I or but I. And cago is undeclinable. Cago is a crosses, where it's smushed together, of chi and ego. Okay? And actually, all the forms of crosses are on page 342 of BBG. Just take a look over there and you'll see all the forms of crosses. So, they're not that many. So, here they are. Crosses in the New Testament, just so you kind of, we don't know all of these yet, but just so you have them all. So, kaiago can become kago, kaimoi and can become kamoi, kaike can become kake, kaikathan can become kakathan, kaikanos can become kakanos, and kaeon or eon can become kan. And that's it. So, those are all the forms of crosses in the whole New Testament. But at this point, we're just learning kago. Uh, the other ones, again, if it's too confusing, just make it its own flashcard. Otherwise, just recognize it. So kago. So you can go back to page 112 here. And we have makarios, makaria, makarion, blessed or happy. Makarios, makaria, makarion, blessed, happy. So in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the is makarios, All right? Megas, megale, mega, large, great. Megas, megale, mega, large, great. And of course, it, we have a lot of English words with mega, like he says in the footnote there. Uh, megaphone, megalosaurus, which is a large dinosaur. Sauros is lizard, so megalosaurus is a very large lizard. And a dinosaur, a uh, megalosaurus would be a very large lizard. Okay, Hard one to have as a pet. Especially since they're extinct. It makes it harder to. Um, okay. Paulus. Paulus, Paulaos, hey, city. Paulus, Paulaos, hey, city. Paulus, Paule, Paulu. Singular, much. Plural, many. Or as an adverb, often. Paulus, Paule, Paulu, singular much, plural many, or adverb often. We didn't really talk about the often. Well, you can see how if this happens, this, this happens much. This happens often. That's where the often comes in for the much and the many. Pos, how? Pos, how? So translate the sentence. Pos. Okay. So you can use that, how. Um, he says in the footnote, there's another word, post, with a acute instead of a circumflex. That's a word that means at all, somehow, or in any way. That only occurs 15 times in the New Testament. Only difference between post, how, and post, at all, somehow, in any way, is the accent. So you can see it is worth learning the accents here. But post is the much more common word. We're only learning post, how. 
Simeon, Simeuta, sign miracle. Simeon, Simeuta, sign miracle. Okay. Now, since we're talking about the word for sign or miracle, do miracles occur today? Okay, God answers prayer. Okay, God answers prayer. So, yes, some miracles occur today? Yes. Are you a cessationist? Yes. But then how do miracles occur? Through answered prayers. Through, through answered prayers unto people? Oh, okay, okay. What do you think? Yes. Yes, but not apostolic miracles? Okay, all right. Does scriptural cessationism require the cessation of miracles? Well, is the... Uh, is there a difference between the way the new birth is a miracle and the way an answer to prayer could be a miracle and the way Jesus raising up somebody who's been decomposing for three days is a miracle? Is there a difference? Yeah, is there a difference? Well, they're all miracles. They're all miracles? Okay. In a generic sense, no, there's no difference. Okay. Because all right. Okay. Uh, the, actually, the answer to this question depends upon how you define the word miracle, and it depends upon which Greek word we're talking about, or Hebrew word. So here we have semeon, which is one word used for miracle. This is miracle as a sign. And actually, for this word, the new birth would not actually be a miracle in the sense of the semeon, but it would be, Jesus raising somebody to decomposing for three days would be a miracle in the sense of a sign. Because when you're born again, People can't just look at you and tell. I mean, it shows up in your life, right? But it's not a sign the way putting somebody's limb back on is or taking this dead guy and bringing him out. So, uh, summary, I actually wrote a blog post about it, um, and the, the, the link is down there. But in, this, in summary, in the sense of the Greek word semeon and the Old Testament word mofaith, and the English word miracle in the authorized version, where a miracle is specifically a sign, the answer is actually no. Miracles do not occur today based on biblical cessationism, which we're not specifically proving cessationism right now. But in the sense of um, sign is a miracle, the answer is no. In the broader sense of a mighty act of God's supernatural power, that is not necessarily a sign, and that's sometimes used, that encompasses the Greek word dunamis, that would be yes, miracles occur today. So miracles do occur today in the sense of dunamis, but not in the sense of simeon. So regeneration, for example, is not a miracle in the sense of simeon, but it is supernatural. So it's very supernatural, but it's not a miracle. But in the sense of dunamis, it is a mighty act of God's power, but it's not a sign miracle and a wonder in the same way feeding thousands of people with a handful of loaves of fishes or raising somebody from the dead is a miracle. So in the terms of the English word miracle, way it's translated, the answer would be no miracles today. Um, Simeon, no, but dunamis, yes. Okay? And so that's, uh, that's the answer if you look at all the different words. In the Old Testament, you have the word mofaith, oath, and pala. Mofaith is 36 times. It's rendered miracle twice. It's also translated sign and wonder. It's used for the plagues, uh, 10 plagues. Um, lots of different miracles, what God will do in the tribulation period, making Hezekiah's sundial go back degrees, supernatural wonders used by false prophets. So, Mo faith is always a miraculous occurrence, like a sign and a wonder. So, in the sense of Mo faith, miracles have ceased. Oath is the word for sign. Sign can be, the word is translated miracle as well. It can be used for unquestionable miracles of signs, but it can also be used in a broader sense. And in that sense of oath, there are miracles today. When they're together, sign and wonder, it's actually no. Pala is a word in the Old Testament, wondrous or marvelous. It's used for uh, the strictly miraculous, um, but, but it's also can be used for things that are wonderful, but not strictly miraculous. So... Uh, Old Testament, you have Mo faith, oath, and pala. Pala and oath are strictly miraculous wonders and signs. Are, are used for, pala and oath are used both for the strictly miraculous and for a broader 
act of God's power that's not necessarily a sign miracle. Mo faith is always strictly miraculous. So for mo faith, not taking place today. Oath or pala, yes, can take place today. New Testament, we have both dunamis and simeon translated as miracle. And we also have the words teros, megalion, endoxon, and paradoxon. Um, dunamis is normally translated power or mighty work. And dunamis, when it's used for miracles, emphasizes the power or capability involved. Um, so that's dunamis. But it can also be used for a mighty act of God's power that's not specifically a sign miracle. So dunamis can be used that way. Um, while Simeon is strictly a miracle as a sign, and so Simeon isn't used. So sanctification is miraculous in the sense of dunamis, but not in the sense of Simeon. Regeneration is miraculous in the sense of dunamis, but not in the sense of Simeon. And then also, uh, like, God's holding the universe together. That's certainly an act power, right? But is it a sign? No. In fact, it's so regular that atheists use it to say that God doesn't interact in the world, right? So, but that's a dunamis, but it's not a simeon, all right? So, miracles and act of God's power, dunamis is yes. Simeon, no. So, that's the answer to that question. And if you want more uh, detail, check that blog post down. Ooh, I just went away. So that's uh, chapter 13. May God help us to think his thoughts after him and be clear in our understanding of the biblical doctrine uh, about miracles. Any questions on that or chapter 13? Anything on chapter 13? Let's take a break. Then we'll do lesson 14. Depending on what church you're in. Like if you're, uh, if you were going to be a uh, foreign, a world evangelist, you're going to be a church planner in a foreign country and you were on deputation, and you get the question on the, question on the questionnaire, do miracles occur today? You, know, you might be a heretic if you say yes or if you say no, so the correct answer, you just put the correct answer down, which is, depends on the Greek word. Are we talking about dunamis or are we talking about simeon? And then you'll be fine on the questionnaire, and you'll also be fine because it's true. So that, that always helps, you know, whether it's true. So um, I actually had... Somebody told me that he actually learned more of his doctrine in like exegesis classes like Greek than from systematic theology classes. And you learn a lot of doctrine in systematic theology, of course. But you can some if you're actually exegeting scripture, that's where you know, that's where you're gonna get get your doctrine from. Or hopefully, you know, it better be based on exegeting scripture. Okay. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, we have a good exegetical insight here on relative pronouns. And he points out that Matthew 1.16 is very precise as identifying Mary, not Joseph, as the one from whom the Lord Jesus was born. So his statement here on the top of the second column, while the genealogy establishes that Joseph is the legal father of Jesus, Matthew emphasizes that Mary is the biological parent of whom, because that's feminine, of whom Jesus was born. Further, the passive voice of the verb egenethe was born, the only passive among the 40 occurrences of genao, uh, to bear, beget, in the genealogy, prepares for Matthew's emphasis upon divine action in the conception and birth of Jesus, 1, 18 to 25. And then he goes on and says, the feminine gender of Hase prepares for the virgin birth, by shifting attention from Joseph to Mary. The Greek relative pronoun is a subtle signature of the relationship of one substantive to another. Here, by the use of the feminine form, the author intentionally stresses that Mary is the mother of our Lord, and later he will clarify that the conception is miraculous, brought about by the Spirit of God coming upon her. So, in other words, in Matthew 1.16... In Matthew 1.16, and Jacob uh, begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, ex haste, of whom was born Jesus, and the haste here is the whom is feminine, of whom Mary specifically, not Joseph, of Mary was born Jesus, 
who is called Christ. Okay, so he was right on with that. That feminine haste there shows that, and that's very good. And now, if you just read the verse in English, you would think that you could conclude that the of whom here would refer to Mary just because it's the closest antecedent. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. So it looks like it in English because it's the closest. But it's a definite clincher in Greek that it has to be Mary because it's feminine. So that's good. Now, near the end of the exegetical insight, it, maybe he's not saying this, but it, he says at the end, the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and it sounds like he's saying it's because of the virgin birth. But the virgin birth did not make the Lord Jesus the Son of God. He was eternally the Son because he was the eternal Son of the eternal Father. He was virgin born both because it was appropriate because prophecy was fulfilled. And it was appropriate because of his character as the eternal Son that he was born of a virgin. But he was certainly the Son of God before his virgin birth. Like in the Old Testament, Psalm 2.12, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So there, the Old Testament, he's already the son, and everyone needs to trust in the Son of God. Or Daniel 3.25, the fourth man walking in the fire was the Son of God. So Jesus was the Son of God, and that is properly translated Son of God. Modern versions say a son of the gods, and that's the mistranslation. Uh, but, so he was the Son of God before the incarnation. Okay? Uh, so the virgin birth was certainly appropriate to that, but the virgin birth did not make him the son. So... So, but a good exegetical insight. Uh, the guy that made it, Michael Wilkins, is a professor at very new, new Evangelical Biola University. But this exegetical insight is certainly a good exegetical insight. Any comments, questions on the exegetical insight? Okay. Good stuff there. Let's go to chapter 14. Even though some of the people that he puts in there are problematic, I do appreciate that he... Mounts is continually trying to show you how this relates to actually understanding the Bible because we aren't learning Greek just because we want to learn a language that dead people spoke, okay? We're learning it so we understand the New Testament. We understand God's word. So, okay, uh, so chapter 14, we're going to learn about the relative pronoun. And this is a relatively easy chapter, pun intended. Uh, the relative pronoun in Greek functions <laughs> a lot like it does in English. And it's also a simple 2 1 2 form. So, not especially difficult chapter. And so, actually, you could say that for this chapter at least, there shouldn't be that much fog. The fog should be relatively light. And so, that's good. Not too much fog right now. Um, and that's good. Chapter 14 is also the final chapter in the entire noun system. So, when we're done with this chapter, we're going to know all the Greek and English grammar you need for nouns, adjectives, and pronouns, and for that entire part of the grammatical system. So that's really good. So we're going to be done with the noun system, and congratulations on that. Now that means verbs start in chapter 15, of course. Now historically, students have often had trouble switching back and forth between nouns and verbs. You're going to look at a verb and want to assign a case to it. Is that verb nominative or accusative? But verbs don't have cases. Okay, they have other things. And so sometimes people can mix up the noun and verb systems, and that's one reason why Mounts has you learn the whole noun system, and then second, just start the verb system after that. So it keeps you from getting them confused. To not mix up the nouns and the verbs, there is one very good thing you can do, and that is be caught up or get caught up if you're behind. Okay? The better you know the noun system, the less chances you have of confusing it with the verbal system. Okay? So if you know your nouns, your adjectives, your cases well, you'll be able to keep them distinct from the verbs. If you're struggling with cases and pronouns and this and that, then it'll be a lot harder to move successfully into verbs. So get caught up or be caught up, and that will definitely help you. All right. All right. Um, and then I, I think I'm going to give a, we're uh, going to have a test too. Over is it an appropriate place for a test after the end of the noun system? So, but just because of the fog, I'm not going to give it like next class. We're going to have a class or two, and then we're going to give the test over the nouns, so you have the fog dissipating situation. But that just expect that. All right. So, what are relative pronouns? There are some technical ways to remember what relative pronouns are, but they're complicated. 
A simple way to remember the relative pronouns in English are the words who, that, and which. So that's what they are. Who, that, and which. And who also occurs in the form of whose and whom. All right? So relative pronouns in English, who, that, and which. This is 14.1. Relative pronouns, their usage in English uh, somewhat differs in person to person. Uh, some general guidelines uh, with the relative pronouns. We tend to use who when the antecedent is personal. So we refer back to a man, we refer back to a woman or a child, we're going to use who. The teacher whom the students love teaches Greek. So the teacher whom, okay? Teacher is the antecedent to whom, and we use who in its different forms because the antecedent is personal. So we use who with personal antecedents. Whose can be used with inanimate objects as well as personal antecedents in the way that who uh, cannot. So you could say sold the car whose color made me ill. So the car whose, you could have an inanimate object there, a car antecedent to whose. So who or whom tends to refer to people. Whose can refer to people as well, but sometimes inanimate objects. We tend to use which for inanimate objects, but not always. Like, if you think it's a person doing magic, you might say which as well, but that would be a different spelling. But which tends to be used for inanimate objects, right? That can be used with any gender, male, female, inanimate object, neuter, but it generally refers to inanimate objects, so that generally inanimate. So, um, relative pronoun is pretty flexible, and uh, we can use that with anything, the Greek relative pronoun. So that's the English usage. As he mentioned in 14.2, the relative pronouns are not interrogatives. So in English, you can use who, whose, or which to ask questions. Who is that? Which, which New Testament is mine? Okay. But in that case, they're interrogatives, not relative pronouns. Okay. So in Greek, we already know the Greek word for asking question. It's tis with an accent. So that's how you ask the question in Greek. Who is tis? That's, we know that already. But we're not talking now about the interrogative who. Who is that? We're talking about the relative who, the teacher whom the students love. So relative pronouns right now, not interrogatives. We're not talking about interrogatives. OK, so that's 40.1 and 2. Any questions about who, that, which? Who dat? Not that's a use, right? OK, relative clauses, 14.3 through 14.5 here. A relative clause is a clause. And so a verb is in it. And it's a clause where the first word is the relative pronoun. Makes it a relative clause. So when the Lord Jesus says in Mark 8.35, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Uh, there you have a relative pronoun. You have hos at the beginning. Now, that's actually, whosoever is actually indefinite in English, but we're, for the purpose of illustration, we're, it's okay. So the relative clause in Mark 8.35, I should just pull that up. Okay. So here's Mark 835. Make it nice and big. So here uh, you have the, the pronoun hoss, relative pronoun hoss, okay? And it's indefinite because of this on, but don't worry about that. But the point here is that um, we have a relative clause, and the relative clause here is whosoever will save his life or whosoever shall lose his life. Those are our two relative clauses. All right? Or like when Christ said, come to me whoever is thirsty. They're the relative clauses, whoever is thirsty. Okay? Introduced by the relative pronoun, whoever. There's a verb in the clause, and there's some other words. So that's how relative clauses work. Okay? Now, it's very important in relative clauses to identify the beginning and the end of the clause. So identifying the beginning is easy 
it's going to be the relative pronoun. So the beginning, easy to identify, relative pronoun. To find the end, you can generally put a comma there, and it will make sense as a clause. And then you've got yourself your full clause. Relative pronoun to the comma, OK, here we go. Uh, if the relative clause is modifying something, if the clause is acting as an adjective, you can pull the relative clause out, and the sentence still makes sense. So if Christ said, come to me, whoever is thirsty, and I will give drink, OK? Uh, if you pulled out the whoever is thirsty, come to me and I will give drink would still make sense. Okay? So that relative clause can be pulled out and you still have a sentence that makes sense. And you have a comma at the end of the clause. So if you have that chunk there and you can conclude you've correctly identified the beginning and end of the clause uh, by the relative pronoun to that break, often by a comma, and if you pull it out it makes sense. So a relative clause, that's how you identify the clause, and that's important. So it's going to begin with, it's going to have a verb, relative pronoun, and some other words. A relative clause will do one of two things. It can modify something else, as in the example, um, whoever is thirsty is telling you about who's going to come to me. Okay. Um, there, it's very simple to translate. You'll find the clause, you'll translate it, and it won't be a problem. Whoever's thirsty, okay, we'll translate that. When a relative clause is not modifying something, but it's functioning as something, it can be a little bit harder to translate. Okay? So it either can modify a noun or it can function as a substantive. The trick here is to remember that when you put your hands around the beginning and the end of the clause, here's the clause, okay? You put your hands around it, the whole unit functions like a noun. So this whole clause here is functioning the same thing as if it was just a noun. So think of the relative clause as a unit of meaning. And once you recognize it as such, you can ask yourself, what is it functioning as? What is this unit of meaning? What is it doing in a sentence? So whoever is not against me is for me. And there, again, it's an indefinite whoever, but it'll still work. So whoever is not against me is for me. Um, relative pronouns, whoever. Where is the end of the clause? What does it take to make that a unit of thought? It's a dependent clause here, but it's whoever is not against me, comma, as it were, is for me. Whoever is not against me is for me. So whoever is a relative pronoun, whoever is not against me is the relative clause, and the clause is functioning as the subject of the verb is. Whoever is not against me is for me. Just like you could say, John is for me. Whoever is not against me is for me. The whole clause is functioning like a, the subject. So if you were to put dashes between the words or in some other way separate out the clause, whoever is not against me there, like we said, is functioning as, you could put brackets. Whoever is not against me, that person, whoever that is, is for me. You could say Tom is not against me, but it's for me. Um, or Tom is for me. So relative clauses are introduced by the relative pronoun. They have a verb in the clause, and they can either modify a noun, in which the case they're easy to translate, or they can function as something, in which the key is to view the relative clause as a unit and consider what function it's performing in the sentence. So one other example, the one on the slide here, my dog eats what is given to him. Here the relative clause begins with what, and it is what is given to him. So it's like you could say my dog eats dog food or my dog eats steak, okay? or my dog eats my carpet. My dog eats what is given to him is that clause that the whole clause is functioning as the object of the verb eats. My dog eats what is given to him. So that's how they function. Either they modify a noun or they function as a substantive. Comments, questions on that? See how learning English helps you learn Greek? Uh, it's not that bad. You'll be all right. OK, let's look at the paradigm of the relative pronoun. So these are forms to memorize. <clears throat> and so we're going to say them all. We'll say the forms in the singular first here. OK, here we go. 
Hoss hey ha, who hase who, ho hey ho, han hain ha. Okay, we have a couple of patterns here to help us identify with identify the relative pronoun here. There's two ways to remember these. You can either, and this is 14.6 and 7 here, you can either think about the case endings preceded by the final stem vowel used for the declension with a rough breath mark and an accent. So that's one thing you can do. Case endings, final stem vowel, rough breath mark and accent. That's one thing you can do. Or you can think about the forms of the article with the tau replaced by a rough breath mark for practically all the forms. So you can think about the article, except instead of tau you have a uh, rough breath mark. Or you think about the case endings preceded by a final vowel with a rough breath mark and accent. So whichever analogy you use, that those, either of those will help make the relative pronoun actually pretty easy to memorize. But whichever one you use, note the forms always have a rough breath mark and they always have an accent. Okay, let's look at the plurals too. And we'll say the plurals. Hoi, hi, ha, hone, 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 hois, heis, hois, hus, has, ha. Now the nominative here has hoi, hi, ha, and then everything else is kind of what you would expect. The nominative plurals are a little tricky. They look just like the forms of the article, except there's an accent on them. So the nominative article is hoi, hi, ha, but it doesn't have the accent, okay? That's the only difference between the relative here and the article. And so when there's a no accent, then you have an article. Relative pronoun always has a rough breath mark and an accent. After the nominative plurals, they're very straightforward. And all the forms of the relative pronoun you would do well to memorize. They're very common. They're easy to memorize. So let's say the forms of the relative pronoun one more time. And then we're going to see if we can compare them with the forms of the article. So relative pronoun, here we go. Hoss, hey, ha. Who, hey, who. Ho, hey, ho. Han, hain, ha. Hoi, hi, ha. Hone, 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 hoist, heis, hoist, hoos, hoss, ha. All right. So now I'm going to ask for two volunteers. All right. And we're going to have you do a quick speed drill here. We're going to have you write out the forms of the article on the board. So go ahead and write. Oh, you will, oh, great. OK, good. So you can write the forms of the article. And then we're going to compare them to the relative pronoun here. If you can't remember, you can peek at the other person, but just try to, try to get them up there. Those articles, which are your friend, you, you want to have them pretty familiar in your mind here. Do we need like um, accents? And yep. Yeah, stick those accents on.
Right now you're doing the article. Oh. Oh, you were writing the relative pronoun. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, you know what? Just finish writing the relative pronoun. We were actually going to compare them, but you know what? It, it, it kind of works if you have them both up like that. I was thinking, boy, those articles are interesting. But yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's, it kind of works out actually then. Okay. Ooh. Oh, look, they're right, right where yours are. Okay, so we've got our articles there. Ha, he, ta. Oh, okay, they're up there. Two, taste, two. To, te, to. Tan, tain, ta. Oh, let's look at mine now. Hoi, hi, ta. Tone, tone, tone. Toys, tais, toys. Tus, tas, ta. Hoi, hi, ta. Tone, tone, tone. Uh, yeah, toys. Toys, tais, toys. Tus, tas, ta. Let's say the article, okay? That's very important. Ha, he, ta. Tu, tais, tu. To, te, to. Tan, tain, ta. Hoi, hi, ta. Tone, 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 toys, ties, ta, tus, tas, ta. One more time. Ha, he, ta, tu, taste, tu, to, te, to, tan, tain, ta, hoi, hi, ta, tone, 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 toys, ties, toys, tus, tas, ta. Oh, you know what? We were just learning that though. So, that, you know. If you mix them up, that it's... It's pretty regular, so I, I, I still should have probably gotten it. No, you're right. It is. And that, that's actually, it is quite regular, and that's actually the nice thing about it. Um, can you see... Let me see. I wonder if I can move these. Oh, I'm going to move these over to the middle here. Ooh, look at that. Okay. There we go. All right. Let's take a look. Hey. Now I have two. You know what? That, that, that worked pretty well. I was thinking, how can I make, get them both up? Here we go. These are for my notes. And then from the extra document here. Oh, look at that. Got them both. Wow. Okay. So, let's see what he's got here. Haas. Is that a sigma? Yeah. It is? It's okay. Very <laughs> I was trying to go fast because you said it was a speed drill. You're right. Yeah, that was, that, that's okay. So, Haas, hey, ha. Who, hey, who. Ho, hey, ho. Han Hain Ha. Han Hain Ha. It's neuter. Yep. Neuter. That's good. Uh, hoi. That's a Yoda, right? Um, Looks like a check mark. <laughs> oh, no. That's a. Uh, oh, that's the accusative. The, 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 oh, the neuter is. The, wait. I accidentally put the. Uh, Nominative down there? Oh, sure. Okay. So, hoi, hi, ha. Oops. Hone, hone, hone. Oops, a lot. Hoist, heis, hoist, hoos, has, ha. Okay. That, that's pretty good because we just, we just said it twice. So that's actually very good. Good job. Um, I'm going to take these down now and just look at the ones on the computer screen. And you can see if you think about those similarities with the article, it's really not bad to learn. You can see you just have for the large majority of forms, instead of the tau, you just have the rough breath mark. So instead of two taste two, genitive singular, you have who hey su. Okay. Um, to te to, ho hey ho, tan tain ta, han hain ha, right? Hoi hai, those you just you don't have the the article. Ta goes to ha, tone tone tone. Hone, hone, hone. Toys, tice, toys. Hoist, heist, hoist. Tus, tas, ta. Hus, has, ha. So, a lot of similarities. If you just remember that, uh, he mentioned both ways the case ending with the with the uh, the linking vowel. Uh, I thought the for me the easier way is just remember that the tau kind of becomes the rough breath mark that gives you the vast majority of them. That was easier for me, but whichever way of the two ways he mentions is fine. But there, you want to be able to, 
you know, write the relative pronoun out quickly. There are lots of relative pronouns, uh, kind of like the article, not as many as the article, but it's definitely worth being able to write them out quickly the way you would do that with the article. So there you can see that comparison. And I think that it's not that bad when you see those similarities. So again, he said the two ways, either think about the case endings preceded by the final stem vowel with a rough breath mark and accent, or just think about the definite article with the tower replaced by the rough breath mark for almost all the forms. And that second one I think is easier, but whichever one works for you, just get the forms down. And you can see that comparison there. No vocatives, right? So. Okay, any questions about the forms of the relative pronoun? When you memorize these, you have to have in your head what they actually mean, right? If you just have these forms in your head, but you don't remember what, what that this is who or which, that's not good, <laughs> right? So remember what they mean. So 14.8 through 11, what would determine which forms in the paradigm that we just learned? And Tim did a really good, Tim Othes did a really good job there just with that real quick. Uh, what, what would determine which forms a Greek speaker would use in a sentence? Well, what determines the form of any pronoun? Relative pronouns are pronouns. So what must be done is to bring back pronoun grammar. So what determines the num number and gender of any pronoun? Antecedent. Antecedent does. When the Greeks were getting ready to say a relative pronoun, they would think back to its antecedent, see what the antecedent's gender and number were, and then choose the right form of hos, he, or ha. And of course, that would be kind of automatic. They wouldn't consciously necessarily think all that through, but that's what they would do. So gender and number are determined by the antecedent. Easy enough. What determines the case of a relative pronoun? Well, what determines the case of any pronoun? Its function in the sentence determines the case of any pronoun. But there's a little bit of a twist with the relative pronouns. So the relative pronouns, what the case is determined by its function inside the relative clause. So relative pronouns in a relative clause and the function of the relative pronoun in the relative clause is what determines the case of the relative pronoun. So um, it, whatever it may appear to be doing outside of that clause is irrelevant. Its function is determined within its clause. Its function is determined by its, its Case is determined by its function inside the relative clause. So here we have some examples. We'll pretend that these English examples, examples are Greek, okay? The woman whom we saw was walking to the subway. What's the relative clause here? Whom we saw. Whom we saw. Relative clause. What's the relative pronoun? Whom, okay? Whom is irrelevant? If you pull that clause out, would the sentence still make sense? Yeah, the woman was walking to the subway. That makes sense. Now, let's just look at the relative clause, whom we saw. What's the function of whom within that specific clause? The verb is saw, so the subject is we. So we saw whom, namely the woman. And if you get stuck on doing this, you can replace the relative pronoun with this antecedent. So we saw whom? We saw the woman. Whom we saw, woman we saw, we saw woman. So woman inside the relative clause is the direct object. So if this was Greek, we would use the accusative form of the relative pronoun to refer back the woman whom we saw. So in this sentence, the word woman would be nominative because the subject of was walking. The woman was walking to the subway. But the relative pronoun, whom, would still be accusative because in the relative clause, it's functioning as the direct object of saw. So were this sentence in Greek, we would have the nominative feminine singular wo woman right next to an accusative feminine singular relative pronoun, referring back to woman, and agreeing with woman in gender and number, but not in case. 
Were the word an adjective instead of a relative pronoun, it would need to agree with its antecedent in case, not just number and gender. But since it's a relative pronoun, its case is determined by the function in the relative clause where it's the direct object. So in Greek, you would have hey gune, and here you'd have hain. You would have, um, so this would be hey, oh, hey gune. Hain. So hegune would be nominative. Hain would be the relative pronoun referring back to the antecedent. That's what you'd have if this was Greek. So relative pronouns, gender and number, determined by the antecedent. Case, function in the relative clause. How about the star that they had seen in the east? What's the relative clause there? That they had seen. That they had seen. Uh, Yuga. What's its function in the relative clause? Or excuse me, what is the function? Um, so that's the relative clause. Uh, and they had seen the star. The star that they had seen. They had seen that in the relative clause. So the word that is the relative pronoun. That is going to be accusative because it's the direct object of seen. That they had seen, what did they see? They saw that. So that is the, it would be accusative as the direct object of seen in the relative clause that they had seen. So it would be accusative in Greek, and gender and number would be determined by the word star for the uh, relative that. If you have difficulty thinking about this, replace the relative with the antecedent. They had seen that, they had seen the star. Whom we saw, woman we saw. We saw the woman. So that's how you can do that. Gender, number by antecedent, case, function, relative clause. So how do relative clauses, any questions on the form first? No? Okay. Now we're talking about function. How do relative clauses function? Now here we're not talking about how the relative pronoun on their own function. How does the clause as a whole function? So now that was this slide pronoun, this slide uh, uh, clause as a whole. How do relative clauses function? How do you find a relative clause in a sentence? Well, we find them used in one of two ways. One way is that they are modifying something. So there it's very straightforward. They will read very naturally from Greek and English. The man who is sitting at the table is my pastor. This would be ha anthropos, hos, etc. Because who is the subject of is sitting. So who is going to be nominative in the relative clause? Who is sitting at the table? So who would be nominative in Greek? It's antecedent is ha anthropos, the man. And so hos would be the nominative singular masculine relative pronoun. It would be masculine and singular to agree with anthropos, man, and its case is nominative. It's not nominative because anthropos is nominative. It's nominative because it's the subject of is sitting, who is sitting. So when relative clauses modify something, the man who is sitting at the table, then it's very straightforward, not a problem. So relative clauses can modify something, the man who is sitting at the table. Who is sitting at the table, modifying man, not bad. The relative clause can also function as something. It can function as a subject, a direct object, the object of a preposition, and so on. There it's a little bit more challenging, but if you think about what's going on grammatically, it won't be too bad. So you may have to add in a few words when the relative clause is functioning as something. So if you saw a relative clause functioning in Greek as something like, who takes up his cross is my disciple you might have to add he who takes up his cross, or the one who takes up his cross. So when a relative clause is functioning as something, you may have to add in a few extra words. So who takes up his cross, that clause is my disciple, so that whole clause is functioning as a subject of is, uh, and so you might just have to say he who, something like that. Uh, it's really not that bad though. So that's how they function, they can modify something, 
or they can function as um, a subject, a direct object, object preposition, something like that. Questions about that? Okay. A few odds and ends on how one translates relative clauses. We've already touched on a lot of this, so it you got some review in here. Um, try to keep the relative clause. You need to keep your relative clause together in your mind. Okay, keep the clause together. Find a relative pronoun. Find the end of the clause. Put your hands around it and view the whole thing as a substantival idea, adjectival idea, whatever it's functioning as, but keep it together. Keep that clause together. It may also help you to put commas around the relative clause. It might be that a relative, if a relative clause is very long, you almost need to view it as a separate sentence. It won't be an independent sentence because it's a clause. But find its verb, find what else is there, whether there's a subject, direct object, modifiers. Uh, you might have to break the relative clause up as if it were a sentence, if it's very big. But um, in translation, remember, relative clauses are always dependent. They're always going to have a verb, but it will never be the main verb of a sentence. So um, keep the clause together. Put commas around it if possible, if, it, if you can, you know, in English. Sometimes in English you may not grammatically put commas around it, but just kind of block it off in your mind. If it's a big one, identify the parts of it. And remember, it will always be a dependent clause. Never is going to have the main subject and verb. So that's how you translate it. Summary. What have you learned in chapter 14? Well, we've learned the relative pronoun hos he ha. It's a 212 form. No big surprises. It looks like the article, except with tau replaced by a rough breath mark, or like a final stem vowel with a rough breath mark and a case ending. Whichever one of those two helps you remember is great. Uh, but remember, the relative pronoun always has a rough breath mark and always has an accent, both. Always both rough breath mark and accent. We learned that the case of the relative pronoun is determined by its function inside the relative clause, while its gender and number are determined by its antecedent, as you'd expect. Relative pronouns introduce relative clauses, and the clause will either modify something or be functioning as something, whether a subject, direct object, object of preposition, etc. They will always be dependent constructions. They will never stand on their own. So that's it for chapter 14 and the entire noun system. You want to give yourself a round of applause? Entire noun system? Now, before we jump into vocabulary, I'm going to make two notes on the vocabulary section. The first one is a bit strange, and the second is very helpful. Kata. Note on kata, kat, kath. When kata is followed by a word beginning with a vowel and a smooth breathing, the alpha elides. So instead of kata emu, it becomes kat emu. If the following word begins with a rough breath mark, the alpha elides and the tau aspirates to a theta. So kata becomes kaf humon. All right. So that's one thing to note on kata. You have the elision and the aspiration. Kata and kat kath. The footnote actually has some interesting information as well on kata. It's interesting to note that catalog and catastrophe begin with a connection with the Greek preposition. So kata, kata, common combining form meaning down, katabasis, declining stage of a disease, catalog, katalogos is counting down in the sense of creating a list. A catastrophe is a sudden disaster or downturn. So I just thought that was interesting. Going back to hados, hadu, hey. Hey, what? Now this is weird. This looks just like logos, loguha, but the article is hey. So is hados, hadu, feminine or masculine? Yes, <laughs> it is feminine, 
but it's part of the strongly masculine second declension. So it declines just like logos, logos loguha. So the rules for declension are not primarily gender based. Stems ending in alpha or eta are first declension. Stems ending in omicron are second declension. Now most second declension nouns are masculine. In fact, all of them that we've learned so far are. But there are some second declension nouns that are neuter and the lexical form ends in on. And the declension is not exclusively masculine or neuter though. There are some second declension nouns that are feminine. Not nearly as many as there are that are masculine, but there are some. So hados, Hade, hadu, he is a second declension feminine noun. It declines just like logos, logos, laguha, but it's feminine, so the article will be feminine. Any modifiers of hados will be feminine. So this is just a sub pattern to be aware of. So hados, hadu, he is a feminine noun, feminine second declension noun. So that is something to be aware of for sure. The only other thing I think to be aware of on hata, hata there he mentions that it, it, hata means when, okay? Don't confuse hata, when, with hati, that since or because. So hati with the yoda, that since or because, hata, when. Don't confuse those. And on te, in my physical copy of BBG, te does not have an accent, and it also doesn't have an accent in my copy of BBG in Logos, but in my accordance copy of BBG, there is an accent. And the lexical form in BDAG also has an accent. So, something to be aware of there. Um, it's exegetically useful on te to note that te is post-positive and it's weaker in force than chi. So chi has a little more umpa than te and post-positive means what? Never the first word. It's never the first word. So it's second word. Like de. De is post-positive. So that's what that means. Okay. One other great blessing here here we have this chart, 33%, 67%. Once you learn the vocabulary words in this section, you will know more than two-thirds of all the words in the Greek New Testament. Now that is pretty cool. All right, so congratulations on that. So certainly you should be able to start digging in your New Testament. You know more than two-thirds of the words you run across. I mean, a lot of them are going to be articles and things like that, but still, two-thirds of the words, that's, that's still pretty impressive. So you bring your Greek New Testament with you to church, study it, use it as much as possible. You will see words you don't know, of course, but you may still know their forms, know their case endings, and of many of those words, and that is a great encouragement. This is the last major milestone of this kind in vocabulary before the last few chapters of the book. So um, now you know more than two-thirds of the words. Congratulations. Memorize the new words. Do your homework and get caught up or remain caught up. Let's go ahead now and say the vocabulary words. Aletheia, aletheos, he, truth. Aletheia, aletheos, he, truth. Eirene, eirenes, he, peace. Eirene, eirenes, he, peace. Eirene, anthropos. Peace, man. Agape. Enopion, genitive before. Enopion, genitive before. Epangalia, epangalias he, promise. Epangalia, epangalias he, promise. Hepta, seven. Hepta, seven. And hepta is indeclinable. It says irenic is from the Greek word irenikos, meaning peaceful. So peace, irene, irenic, irenikos. Thronos, thronuha, throne. Thronos, thronuha, throne. That actually kind of sounds like the English, throne, thronos. Maybe the English words derived from the Greek, I don't know. I haven't checked. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. So, Jerusalem, hey, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, hey, Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem doesn't get declined, it is always just that, but the article will be inflected. And of course, it's a loan word, right? So that's one reason it doesn't change. Kata or kot or koth, genitive down from against, accusative according to, throughout, during. Kata or kot, koth, genitive down from against, accusative according to, throughout, during. Kefale, kefales, he, head. Kefale, kefales, he, head. Hados, hadu, he. Hados, hadu, he. Way, oh, I forgot to say the, what it means. Way, road, journey, or conduct. So, hados, let's say, I'll say, let's say it with the definition again. Hados, hadu, he. Way, road, journey, conduct. All right. And so here it's really feminine. Because it has that hey, even though it's hados hadu. Hos hey ha, who or whom, which. Hos hey ha, who or whom, which. Hata, when. Hata, when. Hutos, thus so in this manner. Hutos, thus so in this manner. Ployon, ployuta, ship, boat. Ployon, ployuta, ship, boat. Hrema, hrematos ta, word saying. Hrema, hrematos ta, word saying. I, I think Kenneth Copeland was Rema Bible Church. It's from this word, because the word of faith movement, the word of faith, you know, cultic, false teaching. But hrema is a good Greek word, meaning word or saying. Te. And so or so. Te. And so so. Care. Ke ros he. Hand, arm, finger. Care. Ke ros he. Hand, arm, finger. If you care, you're going to give me a hand, won't you? Psuke. Psuke se. Soul, life, self. Psuke. Psuke se. Soul, life, self. Like Pastor says at the campus. Oh, I'm studying psychology. You know what psychology is? It's the study of the soul, the psuche. Have you thought about your soul? Do they teach you much about your soul in those classes? Uh, no. <laughs> well, here's the message for your soul. Okay? So that's good. All right. And then he has some previous words there. On and et on. Let's go to page 118. Don't have a slide specifically for that. Okay, so on, when it's used with a relative pronoun, on makes the pronoun indefinite. So who is hos he ha? Hos on is whoever. Okay, so that on makes the who into a whoever. Then you have et on. Et on is if, when, or ever. And so we already learned et on in chapter 9, but now you know to use ever if it's with a relative pronoun. All right? So that's some previous words. Now, 1414, take a look at 1414, what he says, advanced information. You don't need to worry about this too much at this point, but it's good to be aware of the existence of attraction with the relative pronoun. Okay? So he basically explains this quite well. Um, as in any language, Greek does not always follow its basic rules. A language is in a state of flux. Nice, neat grammatical rules can break down. So with a relative pronoun, this can happen. So we saw that its function is supposed to be what it is in the relative clause. But sometimes it's altered to be the same case as its antecedent, as if it were modifying the antecedent. And that is called attraction. So attraction usually happens when the relative pronoun is immediately in proximity to the antecedent, and when the antecedent is dative or genitive, and the relative pronoun would normally be accusative. So for example, in the sentence here, the time of the promise that God, the time of the promise that God promised to Abraham is drawing near. Engizen drawing near, hakronos, the time, tastes upon Galias, the promise, haste, 
which that homologison had promised to ask God to Abraham to Abraham to Abraham. So here, hase is the relative pronoun. It would normally be accusative. It should have been hain because it's the direct object of homologison promised. Um, but it was attracted to the genitive case of its antecedent upon Goliath. So here we, the pronoun was, relative pronoun is genitive when it really should have been accusative based on the normal rules. Okay? So that's what attraction is. Again, that's advanced information. You don't need to worry about it too much right now. Just kind of stick it in the back of your head somewhere that this can happen sometimes. So, <laughs> you doing all right? <laughs> uh oh. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> that third shift, man. Woo-wee. Okay. So, that's attraction. I think that the, the being in bed is very attractive to head off at this point. <laughs> so, all right. Um, take a look. We're... He gives you, now also, he gives you the books of the New Testament here on page 119. He says at the bottom, Paul's letters and Hebrews are preceded by pros. Paul wrote Hebrews, so Hebrews is one of Paul's letters. But, uh, and the reason we know that is 1 Peter and 2 Peter written to the same audience. And then if 2 Peter, Peter says that Paul wrote an epistle to that Jewish dispersion, which was inspired, he says scripture, that has to be Hebrews. So that's how we know Paul wrote Hebrews. Um, if you compare 2 Peter 3, uh, 15 to 17 with the audience of 1 and 2 Peter, Paul had to have written Hebrews, and it's the only inspired book written to the Jewish dispersion. So here we have books of the New Testament. So here we go, we have Matthion, Markon, Lucon, Ioannin, Praxis Apostolon, Chromaeus, Corinthius, Hase, Corinthius, Dua, Galatas, Ephesius, Philippeus, Kala Saes, Thessalonicus, Hase, Thessalonicus, Dua, Timotheon, Hase, Timotheon, Dua, Titon, Philemona, Hebraeus, Jacobu, Petru Hais, Petru Dua, Ioane, Ioannu Hais, Ioannu Dua, Ioannu Trace, Yuda, Apocalypsis Ioannu. Notice that the books where it's 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, the Greeks use the letters of the alphabet for the numbers. So you don't say Corinthius Alpha, Corinthius Beta. You say Corinthius uh, Hase, Corinthius uh, Dua. So, want to mention that? Let's uh, do it one more time here. Matthion, Markon, Lucon, Ioannin, Proxes Apostolon, Promaius, Corinthius Hase, Corinthius Dua, Galatas, Ephesius, Philippeus, Colosses, Thessalonicus, Hase, Thessalonicus, Dua, Timotheon, Hais, Timotheon, Dua, Titon, Philemona, Hebraeus, Jacobu, Petru, Hais, Petru, Dua, Ioane, Ioannu, Hais, Ioannu, Dua, Ioannu, Trace, Yuda, Apocalypsis, Ioannu. And so we have the names of them in Greek. And so from now on, after this, if you refer to one of the New Testament books, please refer to it by its Greek name instead of its English name in class. Okay, so we're going to try to do that. So try to learn the names of the books in Greek. They are very similar to English, of course, but uh, I think that's good to do. All right, take a look at the title. In, do you have a King James with you? Just the Greek. Look at the title to the book of Revelation in, in English. Tell me what it says. And then also take a look at the title of Revelation in your TR. What's the title in English? 
Really? Or at least in mine. Oh. Should be the revelation of St. John the Divine. Really? Okay. Well, in the Greek title, it says revelation. If you have like a, let me see what, uh, let me see what mine says. That, that's like a study Bible though, right, too? Yeah. Yeah, that makes a difference. Sometimes they, let's see what the title is in here. All right. General plus James, Revelation, Peter, John. Here we go. So I've got a real this is the real thing. So it says, The Revelation of St. John the Divine is the title. And what is the Greek title? Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis. Toy. You're trying to read it. It's all capital, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. You oh. want I know here I put it in lowercase up there. But yeah, it's in all capitals. But it's Apocalypsis to Hagiu Yoanu to Theologu. The Apocalypse, the Revelation, that's what the Revelation is called, the Apocalypse, right? So the Revelation um, of the Holy John the Theologian. And St. John the Divine, um, St. John Hagiu Yoanu is, you know, all believers are saints. And Theologu is translated as divine. But theologu is where we get the word theologian from. So did you know that the word theologian is in the title to the book of Revelation? So John is called a theologian. What is a theologian? Is a theologian somebody who sits in a chair and does nothing useful for the Lord um, and just kind of looks in the sky and thinks about how many angels dance on the head of a pen? Well, uh, here we have the definition of theologos, theologuha, in BDAG. So uh, the theologian... Is it says is someone who speaks of God or divine things, God's herald, right? Theos, logos, right? Logos word. So a theologian is somebody who speaks of God or of divine things. He's God's herald. So with that definition of theologian, should every preacher be a theologian? Yeah, it's good to be a theologian, isn't it? Speaking of God or divine things. Proclaiming his truth, being his herald. It's wonderful to be a theologian. It's wonderful for every believer to be a theologian, to speak of divine things and speak of God. And every believer should be God's herald and speak of God and divine things to fellow believers and to the unconverted. So we should be like the Apostle John and be a theologian. <laughs> Apocalypsis to Hagiu Ioannou to Theologu. All right, so that's really good. I wanted to share that with you. Okay, we're going to learn a little bit of vocabulary here from our Speak Koine Greek. So look at pages 11 and 12 in there. You can get out the Speak Koine Greek and then also um, we're at that 800 words book too. We're going to end the day with some cartoons. Who can complain about that? Well, complaining is bad. Anyway. I, when, when, since God killed people for complaining, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Okay, weather conditions. And here in Wisconsin, you never know. So you just never know when you might have to say this to somebody in Koine Greek. Um, you know, learning these words could save somebody's life one day who doesn't speak English but knows Koine Greek. All right, so a big hailstorm is coming. Kaladza Megale Erkatai. Say that together. A big hailstorm is coming. Kaladza Megale Erkatai. Man. It is a snowy day. Hemera tes kianos estin. It is a snowy day. Hemera tes kianos estin. That's going to come sooner than you think. It is bad weather today. Samaron came on Estin. It is bad weather today. Samaron came on Estin. It is cold. Psukas Estin. It is cold. Psukas Estin. You can just shiver. Shiver when you say that. Rain is coming. 
or the King James says there cometh a shower. Okay. Uh, he said it is going to rain. So it's going to rain is what he said. Rain is coming would be pretty literal. There cometh a shower is fine too, of course. So we'll just say rain is coming. Rain is coming. Amboss Erkatai. Rain is coming. Amboss Erkatai. Amboss is rain. Erkatai is coming. It is hot. Cowson Estin. It is hot. Cowson Estin. Now, if you're watching this video and you're in the south of the U.S., I mean, Greek isn't useful. Come on. It is raining, or there is rain. Genetai ambos. It is raining. Genetai ambos. Ambros. Excuse me. Ambros. Because you need an umbrella. So ambros. It is windy. There is wind, because the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now here's the sound thereof. Genetai animas. It is windy. Genetai animas. There is lightning and thunder, or literally, more literally, there are lightnings and thunders. Genontai ostropai kai phoni. Phoni is thunders, ostropai is lightning. So there are lightnings and thunders. We'll say singular, but it, it is plural uh, in, in Greek here. So there is lightning and thunder. Ginontai ostropai kai phoni. Now the storm is over, the sky is clear. Hauranos te kathariate ti estin. The sky is clear. Hauranos te kathariate ti estin. You know what Syriac is, right? Apographa? So it's in the Apographa. The weather is nice. Eudia estin. The weather is nice. Eudia estin. Oh, that's the end of those. So, very useful words. Now you can describe the weather. So that's good. Now we also have some cartoons. Page 21 through 23. We have the Genos, the family here. Now, remember that we're, we're doing the ones 50 or more and then 30 to 50 or um, could be like extra credit. So, you don't need to learn the, like, even the word genos at the top is kind of good. It can't hurt to know it. Just if you want to talk in Greek with your family, you're genos, okay? But genos is only 20 times. So, so there's a picture of the genos, the family. And then we have this word over here. Who's this guy? What, 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 who is he? Pater, patros, ha. Father. So we'll say that. Pater, patros, ha. Father. father. Yeah, we'll say it. Too. Yeah, father. This guy, who's he? Yeah, he's a son. Huyas huyuha. Ooh, here's here's the bro. Here's the sis. So the brother. Adelfas adelfuha brother. Adelfu is you. Adelfas adelfuha. Now this is not quite what they probably would have done in the first century. Uh, ride the skateboard, but I mean you never know. I mean the Romans were pretty amazing. Okay. So, child here. Technon technu ta. Technon technu ta. Child. Here's the mother, the mater. And she's feeding. That's trophos, but that's only one time, so you don't need to learn that one. So, mater, matros, hey. Mater, matros, hey. Now, he actually, now, yeah, it's fine saying mother. He, he, he's trying to get you to have the picture in your head, so you're thinking it in Greek. So, with... At least for this one, we're going to indulge him, and we're not saying in English right now, just the Greek, and we're just thinking the word, but it's fine to think it in, 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 in English. It's okay. So here's the bride, the gune, and the groom is the nymphe. So gune, gunaikos, hey. Gune, gunaikos, hey. It's, it's, it's the woman or the wife. Aha, here was the aner, the man. Aner, androsha. Aner Androsha. Then we have a sister here, a Thugater, and Adolphe is a sister, but those are less common ones, so don't need to worry about those. And then, of course, the next page we have a few other ones that are even less common. So, um, yeah. You have Ganyus, Ganyus Brephos, 
Panthera ase, Patria as, Genalogia ase. That's a funny picture for genealogy, right? Um, and all these other ones. But that's um, those ones on that page are the ones we need to learn. So, okay, that's chapters 13 and 14. That's the whole noun system. Congratulations, that is just fantastic. And after I give you a chapter or two to get rid of the fog, we are going to have a test over the noun system. Any comments, questions on any of that? Try to use the vocabulary and uh, in real life, okay? It just, that's how you use language. Language is designed to be used and spoken. Any comments, questions? That's, I think it's great that you get to get, do cartoons. All right, we are going to sing. Since actually we just learned the Ha Jesus Me Agapa, I'm going to, instead of singing the verse song, we're going to sing the Jesus Loves Me song. And then we're just going to say 2 Corinthians 13, 14. So that will be good. Wish you a benediction. All right. Get that up here. Okay, let's stand up. Ha Jesus me agapa, ha tigrafe keruse, pai dia e sin auto, astenusi dunatai. Na Jesus agapa, na Jesus agapa, na Jesus agapa. He grafe ke ruse. I'll say this together too. He caris tu kariu Jesu Christu, kai he agape tu theu, kai he koinonia tu hagiu numatas, metapontun humon. Amen. <laughs>